А, смотрите, тогда повторю сначала. В этом году, во-первых, Сачка решила создать секцию информационной безопасности. Не было ранее. Были такие намеки, но как такой секции не было. Ну и решили сделать ее сразу нормально. И в этом году компания Simtek позвала Дэвида Басби из компании Percona. Он отвечает, во-первых, это security архитект, специалист, который отвечает за всю информационную безопасность компании, начиная с бизнес-логики, заканчивая ну, конечными бэкапами, потому что Percona занимается именно бэкапами. Ну, не знаю на самом деле, что еще такого интересного рассказать. Он сам о себе расскажет немного. И вообще, как бы, знакомьтесь. Дэвид Базби. Окей, unfortunately, this is all going to be in English, because I don't speak a word of Russian. So, hello. So, who am I? I am Дэвид Базби, as I've just had an introduction. I've been with Pocona since January of 2013. Contract with them through a UK-based company. I've got a limited company. It's only got me employed, so yeah, that's useless. Um, 17 some years as a sysadmin slash DevOps, hacking around, just breaking into code, breaking into websites. Some clients like it, some clients don't, funnily enough. Um, I've been a jiu-jitsu instructor since I was age 12. Uh, I've got a second down black belt in jiu-jitsu, and I teach for a local non-for-profit club. I also volunteer to teach kids computing at a local UK secondary school. Um, we teach on the Raspberry Pi, we teach them Scratch, Python, Minecraft APIs. We did some Node.js um, car project where we had the Node.js server stream back some media while it was riding around on the car. The school Wi-Fi was terrible. Ask me about it later, I'll tell you all about it. Security paranoia and lifetime member of the Tinfoil Hat Club. I am ultimately paranoid about this, but since I've taken my CIWSP, I have had to mellow it out and become more business focused. Okay, so we're going to cover what is an attack surface. We're going to go over acronym HELL. Vulnerability naming, is it stupidity or is it helping to drive the message home? Detection versus prevention, there's a lot of people that think they should just either detect that something's going on and not worry about it, don't block anything, allow transactions to finish, or they should prevent them, they should deploy an IPS because they don't want the bad guys getting in. Which one's right? Well, they're both right, and I'll explain that to you in a bit. Emerging technologies, I'll go over some of the technologies that are coming out now that help you improve your security posture. And we're going to briefly go over 2014 through 2017, what the heck has been going on. And we're going to go over the highlights only. We're not going to do a deep dive because I filled up 20 slides on this before I realized it was time to cut back on the material. Um, we're going to go over a live compromise, at which point I will swap laptops, and I will actually break into a Linux LAMP stack running over two servers. And if that fails, I've got a video. Okay, so what is an attack surface? It's, an, uh, it's a point at which you or your application or your database or your physical systems, your network, your employees, that's your biggest part, or the hosting provider can be attacked. So going over the application, I shouldn't have to tell this. Hopefully anybody with any development experience knows you should sanitize all user inputs. There's no excuse for that. You have to sanitize all user inputs. You have to make sure that what's going into your system has been run through some logic to ensure that it's not going to be SQL injection. It's not going to be stored XSS. It's not going to be stored cross-site request forgery, etc. cetera. Um, have a look at deploying a web application firewall. You can use mod security, and I give that as an example here. You can run it in detect-only mode. Once you run it in detect-only mode, it's going to report only. It's not going to block any transactions to your website. I have run it in detect-only mode before, and it has told me that if I switch it on, I'm going to just completely annihilate the site, which I, when I took it offline and tested, that's exactly what happened. Okay, IPS. If you have an IPS or an intrusion prevention system, do not leave it in intrusion detection mode. Why are you paying for an intrusion prevention system if you have not put it in prevention mode? It doesn't make any sense. They can run in IDS mode, that's true, and that's report only. But I'll go into that in a bit more detail shortly. So, recurring audit procedures. Um, everybody go bangs on about recurring, recurring audit procedures. What the hell does that even mean? Do I really have to download all of my logs, spend two days reading through every single transaction just to make sure that everything going through the web application is absolutely fine? No, you don't. If you have a procedure in place so that you're actually getting these feeds in real time, you're pretty much fine. And I don't mean just spew everything to you like drinking from the fire hose. I, for instance, work with Slack, 
and I work with Paper Trail, which is a software as a, um, software as a service that provides logging and Elasticsearch type functionality. But it has hooks based into that. So I have that feed every 10 minutes a digest of the IDS logs over to a security channel. And on there, I will have a look at those in the morning, scroll through them, block about 20 network ranges from China because they're brute forcing our systems or attempting to. We don't use passwords. We just use SSH keys and two-factor authentication, but they haven't actually gotten the message that trying to brute force username and password is not going to work. So blacklist them. Mandatory access controls. A lot of people have a look at SE Linux and go off. This blog told me to turn it off. My website doesn't work. My application doesn't work. My database doesn't work. If you're turning it off, you're doing it wrong. You need to understand the technology. Don't be afraid of it. Ensure that you actually understand what it's there to do. SE Linux is there to stop you from shooting yourself in the foot. More importantly, it's stop, to stop you being compromised by an adversary. The live demo that I will give when SE Linux is turned on doesn't work. I will tell you that now. I have to disable SE Linux using Ansible playbooks for it to even work. So ingress and egress controls. Again, something you'll probably hear a lot of. They are firewall rules. What comes in and what goes out. IP tables. Every single system, every Linux system's got IP tables on it. Use them. OK. What about database? You have to do, go through some network segregation. You have to do this with PCI anyway. What that means is you have to separate the network that it's on. Um, in simplest terms, if you deploy IP tables, you can deploy a new chain. And you can only allow access to 3306 if it's MySQL. If you're using MongoDB, Postgres, or something else, the port will be different. Selective grants, this is going back onto MySQL terminology. This is the permissions that you create the database users with. If your database user has too many permissions, you're going to get your database application, sorry, your web application owned. Pure and simple. I'm going to abuse that in a moment with the grant all. Grant all in MySQL terminology gives them the super permission. It gives them the create routine permission. It also gives them the file permission. So what I do there is I write a malicious UDF out to the file system. I then reload that malicious UDF, which is a to defined function, into the MySQL system using the create routine function. And with the super privilege, if I wanted to do it, nothing else, and I just wanted to be a script kitty that's got access to your system, I could just troll the hell out of you. Because with that user that's got super, I can kill any qu query. I can reset any slave. I can reset any master. I can change bin log names, permissions, whatever, especially with file. So you want to avoid identified by plain text password. What I mean by that is your DBAs or your sysadmins or whoever the hell is actually working on the system is going to log in and they're going to create a user. When they do that, that SQL is written to a MySQL history file. So if I don't have access to a user that's got the privileges I need to escalate my attack, chances are if I have a look at the history file, there is a user in there that I can use and the password is right there. You can actually create MySQL users just using a hash of the password. It doesn't stop an attacker getting in, but it slows them down considerably. Egress, ingress and egress controls, we've been through that, that's your firewall. So, limit physical access to your hardware. That should be a no-brainer. But there's a lot of places, small companies, that don't seem to do that. They still have servers that are a tower, it's on the floor, it's on somebody's desk, it's in a room that's locked in the executive management's cupboard or something stupid. Barclays had a 1.3 million pound haul or theft. And they had that because they had two people turn up to the building with a shirt and tie, with a little plastic badge and said, I'm IT service and I'm here to service your PC. Nobody checked. So what they did is they actually plugged this little device in that's up in the top right hand corner, which is a KVM over 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. So it's a commodity device. It's something you can pick up off the shelf. It's there to help people do their job. BBC went completely mental with this, and they called it a high-tech device. It's not a high-tech device. It's a commodity device that's been used in an incorrect fashion. It's something you're going to see a lot of. I've got a whole plethora of toys, little devices, which in themselves are not malicious. But they can be. 
Okay, social engineering, it's just a new terminology. Social engineering isn't anything scary. You haven't got to train everyone against social engineering. I mean, it's just common sense. Somebody rings up and says, hello, can I have your password? Can I have the serial number off the back of your box? Can I talk to you about the virus that's on your Windows PC, despite the fact you haven't run Windows in about 20 years? You know, these little phone calls that you get, you, you realize, as somebody that's technical, that it's a scam. These people are trying to get into your system. Very simple things. Most people don't work like that. I know at least four people that are in the area around me that have been conned into giving money to somebody, send them a bit of money because they're stuck somewhere and they need 10,000 pounds or something stupid to get out of the country, which is a complete scam. Okay. Don't rely on biometrics. And I've already been over, don't you challenge implied trust. Just because somebody's wearing a uniform or somebody's wearing a badge, don't trust them. Not because they're wearing a uniform or they're wearing a badge. They're just items of clothing. You shouldn't just take it at face value of, that person's a police officer. That person works in IT. That person's a manager. Just because they're wearing a certain set of clothing. There is a story that when somebody was red teaming a company, they walked into the executive office straight through the front door. They walked in behind um, in a company where they had RFID tags for all the things. They just cloned the cards, went straight through, walked in and sat down in the boardroom. They sat there in the board meeting for an hour and 45 minutes before somebody asked them who they were. At which point they said, I'm from the Pentest company. I've been uh, recruited by the CEO. This will be going in my report. Promptly stood up and left. <laughs> uh, don't rely on biometrics. Everybody just goes on about the newest thing. If you're just deploying biometrics, you're going to get owned as well because Mythbusters had an example where they had a $90,000 biometric unbreakable lock. It sensed moisture levels, it sensed the uh, pulse behind the fingerprint, etc. So what they did is they photocopied the valid fingerprint, they licked it, they put it on a real human finger, and then they unlocked the lock. $90,000 worth of equipment beaten by a $20 photocopier, $20, $50 photocopier, and a bit of spit. <laughs> it's terrible. Remove unneeded services from your hardware. I have seen on plenty of occasions Bluetooth D running on rack mount servers for God knows what reason. You don't need it. If you don't need it, get rid of it. There is an exploit out right now, um, Blues or something along those lines that actually compromises this and allows you to escalate up to root level permissions. Your rack, well, yeah, there you go. Rack mount server probably doesn't need Bluetooth D. If it does, talk to me later because I have got no idea of anyone that needs to run Bluetooth on a rack mount system. Okay. So here we go. We'll go over network selective ACLs. I went through that before. There's a quick IP table as an example of how to create a new chain, only allow access via 3306. If your web server is trying to connect to SSH or the MySQL server, you're doing it wrong. Block it. Doesn't need access. MySQL doesn't need to be accessible from the internet. I have heard this way too many times. From somebody said, I need to be able to access it when I'm at the cafe, or I'm on a mobile phone, or when I'm on holiday, or when I'm sat somewhere where I don't need to be. That's what VPNs are for. Having MySQL exposed to the internet, having Elasticsearch exposed to the internet, having Postgres exposed, any database related service exposed, MongoDB especially, is a bad idea because they will get ransomware. And all the ransomware does is take a backup of all your data, wipe all your data, and put a nice message that says, send me 0.2 bitcoins to this address to get your data back. Segregation, like I said, network separation. If you deploy intrusion prevention, host-based intrusion prevention, for instance, is file integrity enforcement. You need to enforce that files aren't being changed. You can do that. You might want to deploy then a network-based IDS something that's going to tell you everything that's coming in through the network, and then you have intrusion prevention on the host. Research the technologies and mix and match them as you need to. So let's go over employees, or layer eight, or meatware. They are the single largest vulnerability to any company anywhere. Nobody will be able to convince me otherwise. 
So awareness training. We bang on about awareness training. You've got to be aware of all, all this crap. Got to do this, got to do that. You're a bad person. Uh, one of the best examples I was ever given was when the fox raids the chicken house, do you blade in the chickens? No. So why are you blaming your users when they mess up and get malware, get their accounts hacked? If they're not aware of the threat, they can't do anything about it. So rather than beating them with a keyboard, which I know is very tempting, just help them, educate them a little bit. I run phishing campaigns against the company that I work for every four months. I still get about 20% return on credentials entered, but that's neither here or there. Um, <clears throat> social media betrays a wealth of information. It used to be really hard to find information about people. Really hard. You used to have to spend a few days researching your target before you la launched your attack. Now they're just taking a picture of the meal every time and posting it on Instagram. Or Facebook. Or Twitter. <laughs> with the location. With the time. So I have a look at a target who's a secretary or an executive assistant at a company, and they have a social media feed on Instagram, and they take a picture of their pumpkin spice latte or whatever the hell it is that they want to drink in the morning every time they stop off at Starbucks. I know where that person is. I know at what time they are there. I know what their job role is because they're on LinkedIn, and they love to socialize with everyone. So that's, that's great. So while she's just getting up, getting a refill, laptop, and walk off. Very simple attack. But because the user wasn't aware of it, the whole company's database um, data is now compromised. Bring your own device. I've heard this called bring your own disaster, because it is actually true. Your employees walking around with their own mobile phones, they probably connect to corporate resources like email, Google Drive, or whatever it is that you've got deployed. Um, it, at 44 Khan, I had a conversation with a few people, and at Pocono Live in Santa Clara, I had a conversation with a few people as well. They would use their mobile devices to connect to VPN, to connect to SSH, to do their two-factor authentication. They were not encrypted. Funnily enough, none of them volunteered to actually let me have their phone for 30 seconds. Imagine that. <clears throat> OK, physical devices and physical attacks. So in the GIF in this top right-hand corner, it's a very simple example. I've got a little guy with a camera. I just I could ask somebody to just stand there with the GoPro. OK, I've got a fake microphone in my hand. I'm just going to stand there. I'm going to do some street magic. Okay? Can, anybody, can I, can I just speak to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come here. Um, have you got a phone? Of course they've got a phone. 99% of people have got a phone. Okay, great. Can I, can I show you a magic trick? Yeah. So they hand over the phone. At which point I run away. Because the moment you've got physical access to any device is the moment that it's absolutely owned. The FBI paid $1 million dollars for a zero-day exploit for an iPhone so that they could get around the encryption. This was in the media. There are also ver various attacks, like the rubber ducky. I've got USB rubber ducky here. If you've got a four-digit point pin on your Android device, I would suggest you re replace that four-digit pin very quickly, because I could program this tiny little thumbstick to crack that four-digit password in under 12 hours, which sounds like a long time. But if you've stolen the phone, I've got as much time as I want. And if you're thinking about remote wipe or anything like that, that's fine. I'll just put your phone inside a Faraday cage. And Faraday cages aren't something that are unobtainable to people. They're just a charged little cage that's at wire. It's very simple to set one up. At which point they won't have cellular network, they won't have Wi-Fi network, they won't have remote wipe capability. Physical attacks, uh, yeah, we've just gone over that. There's also various software bypasses, like the Android system used to suffer from PTP ADB, which is peer-to-peer -peer Android debug. Most people would flash their Android phones because they were fed up with the vendors never updating them. Still are. Um, but by default, it would turn on the ADB, which is the Android debug, because there was a lot of crashes in the custom firmwares that were available. So Android B debug allows you to dump out the information as to why that particular firmware is crashing and file a bug report or fix the problem yourself. And these are all techies just doing this. It's kind of like when you rooted an iPhone and it had a default password still set on it. Vendor ha most vendors now, Samsung, um, still have a little hidden debug protocol 
in the USB connection. I was particularly peeved when I heard about this and had it demonstrated, because I've got a Samsung tablet. But the point is that vendors are now trying to find clever ways to be able to still, de still debug their hardware if there's a problem with it. Makes sense from a business point of view, but they leave these things switched on when they ship them to market. What that means is you have a debug interface like a JTAG or an ISC, and when you connect to that, you can actually rip out clear text serial connections directly into the memory. So if this device has powered on, even if it's locked with a pin, the encryption keys, if it has any, are loaded into memory. You can dump those encryption keys out of memory, image the drive, and get all the data back. Remote attacks, things like Karma and Yasuga. Um, most commonly, some people might have heard of the Wi-Fi pineapple. This runs Karma, as it's called now. Wireless devices will actually send out beacons every time that they're powered on. These beacons say, I am looking for these networks. Is anybody these networks? The project used to be called Yasagar because in old German it translates to the yes man. And the yes man would say, I am all of those networks. Please connect to me. Instant man in the middle for every single wireless device. That's not been fixed. It's not fixable either because it's embedded to how wireless networking works. Um, okay. Malicious human interface devices. Who's heard of having USB drives just dropped in a car parking space or a social space or free USB drives you give away at a conference? <laughs> you have two types of doing this. You have a, a pre-programmed attack, something like bad USB, that overrides the inbuilt chip and manages to get and manages to get control over the system via emulating a keyboard. You also have the attack which a bunch of pen test companies are doing now where they deploy what's called honey docs. The honey docs are enticingly titled subjects like employee wages, HR documents, private CEO files, etc. that encourage someone to open them up. They hide the numbers, say it's an Xbox spreadsheet, until they enable macros. As soon as they enable macros, they see the numbers, but they've also executed arbitrary code in the background. So, what about malicious Thunderbolt devices? Yes, this is a thing. The attack and proof of concept is called Thunderstrike 2. Thunderstrike 2 infects the chip that's actually on the, the Thunderbolt device. Um, you then plug that into a Mac. The Mac firmware is actually infected at that point, and it propagates just like a virus. I've not seen this used in the wild. I've not seen this used to propagate an actual attack, but it is actually theoretically possible. Um, challenge implied trust, like I said before, it's okay to ask for ID. We ask systems for this all the time. Every time you SSH to a system, especially if it's a new one, you'll say yes or no to a fingerprint key. It's okay if you just ask someone, it's like, can I just see some ID? Or can I just ask, can I just speak to someone before I let you in here? It's not rude. <laughs> well, unless you tell them to get out until you do. Um, oh, there you go, there's the bottom one. Hello, I'm calling from the Internet Computer Security Center in a really, really bad Indian accent. I'm here talking about the virus on your Windows PC, which is hilarious because, like I said, Windows hadn't actually used it in 20 years until recently. Uh, TNC Duino, human interface device. It is not a purposely built malicious device. It's a tiny, and I mean it is actually tiny, Arduino. And I can program this to be a keyboard. And I can program this to hit keystrokes in less than one millisecond, and it'll go really quick. So these are some commodity devices, and I haven't actually put a picture there. The commodity devices are you can actually buy them from a market. These are very, very cheap. You can program them to be various things. I've got the Bash Bunny, which is brand new, the USB rubber ducky, the Land Turtle, and I've got the Pineapple as well. If you want to speak to me about any of them, I've got them here, and we can go through all of their features. Um, certain allowances must be ma made, and the reason that you must make allowances is because you want to go to sleep at night. You don't want to sit there rocking yourself to sleep thinking, God, what have I got myself into? Why am I working in IT? It's horrible. So you've got to have some trust in services. Um, you, you will ask service providers about their service level agreements, but also check if they've been any, through any compliance initiatives, or things like PCI, Sarbanes-Oxley, HIPAA, or anything else that you think might be effective 
for your business, even if you do not have to be PCI compliant yourself, you still want to know that they've been through the rigor of doing this. It's just a confidence step. Trust in the model, trust in mobile networks, GSM is broken. The GSM protocol for mobile communication has been hacked many times and decrypted. I've seen this show, uh, been shown at a few shows where they actually reassemble the SIP protocol that's running in the background and have the conversations that they were making over that or intercept the text messages. But then, that's why we've got encrypted apps like Signal and Wicker. IDS and IPS, um, it's a HIDS, HIPS, NIDS, NIPS. Host-based intrusion detection system, host-based intrusion prevention system, network-based intrusion detection system, uh, yeah, intrusion detection system, network-based intrusion prevention system. Network deals with the network, host-based deals with files. Some will do both. Uh, SCADA, so the supervisory control and acquisition of data, sorry, acquisition of data, or something along those lines. Hydroelectric, uh, supervisory control and data acquisition. There you go. Hydroelectric dams, metal foundries, all on the internet, where you can control them. Uh, there was an example by Dan Tantler where he talked about the Fumel Dam, which had controls on it to allow you to open the floodgates, which would have been a really bad time for everyone that was living down there. Uh, IoT, or IOT, Internet of Things. Seriously, Wi-Fi enabled light bulb. Stop it. If you work for an IoT company, please just put a firewall on the damn thing. I'm fed up of reading about dishwashers that have path, um, path walking vulnerabilities based on the web server. It's a 2002 CVE for sake. Please fix it. Uh, ACL, POLOP, so access control list and path of least privilege. Path of least privilege means you only get the access that you actually need. Not I want root because I want root. As an attacker, that's what I'm going for. I want root because I need it to get to wherever I'm going. But your users do not need root. They do not need sudo. If they say that they do, it's probably because they're being lazy. They want to do their job quickly, and they don't want to be hindered by the access security that you've got in place. Mac and DAC, mandatory access controls, discretionary access controls. Mandatory access controls are SE Linux, AppArmor, GR Security. They help protect you from shooting yourself in the foot when you've done dumb things with the discretionary access controls, which is your POSIX permissions. If you trim anything 777, oh, damn, damn it. If you trim out anything 777, yeah, don't. So let's go over. Vulnerability naming, or is it driving the message home? Because is it dumb or is it in it? We've got Poodle, so padding, or uh, padding Oracle on downgrade legacy encryption. You've got crime, you've got beast, they are also SSL exploits. You've got Heartbleed and Dirty Cow. Heartbleed abused a buffer overflow vulnerability that's pulled secret data out of the SSL. You probably heard about it and probably had to try and patch against it. Dirty Cow would actually allow you to root, write root owned files that you didn't have permissions to, which is great because if you don't think this can actually lead to privilege escalation, write a cron file and just sit back and wait for the shells to come in. It got really bad. Heartbleed virus. Anybody ever heard about the Heartbleed virus? This was in the media because they got hold of it. They didn't really understand it. So they called it a virus. It's not a virus. It's a vulnerability. iCloud had a breach. Hospira drug pump had a ble uh, breach. The Hospira drug pump, if nobody knows, is an insulin pump or it's a drug administering pump. It would deliver morphine for cancer patients, etc. It had remote admin, with admin, admin is the password, and clear text over Telnet, straight on the network. Ransomware has been hitting Elasticsearch, MongoDB, and MySQL, which is why you should not allow it direct access to the internet. Data breach is Ashley Madison, Wonga.com, geeked in, Adobe, the list goes on. Windows has a vulnerability, double agent. If you haven't read on this, I suggest that you do if you're using Windows. It's a feature. So they're not going to patch it. It allows DLL injection, which is a really bad thing. Uh, Vault 7 documents dropped. If you think that's bad, just go back and have a look at the NSA ANT catalog. IoT vulnerabilities. Seriously. Web server on a dishwasher. Why the hell would I want a web server on a dishwasher? Seriously. Even worse, one that's got a directory traversal vulnerability. It's a 2002 vulnerability. 
Broadcom Wi-Fi chips have various things that attack most popular phones. Uh, this affects the iPhone, it affects the Nexus 6P, for example. Target had a breach that was actually a breach that went in through their heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system, where the malware was deployed. The problem is there wasn't a separation of systems, so when the technicians worked on the HVAC system and then went straight back into the corporate network, they took the malware with them. Internet of Things, where minimum viable product is the main driving force until we have a scathing news article or get sued in a class action lawsuit because we're leaking data everywhere. SCADA, supervisory control and data acquisition, we've gone through that already. In other words, stop putting sh on the internet. Please. Okay, so we're seeing a slow shift towards better security, but we still have some holdouts. Some are fearful about implementing that intrusion prevention system because they don't want to stop anything working. Okay, so, or an IDS system that just spews a bunch of alerts to their team and they don't know how to cope with it. Remember what I said about filtering stuff into a contextual thing so that you can get them into a chat channel? You reduce the noise. So here you go, here's an IDS. An IDS will tell you that your house is on fire but it will not do anything about it. So, an IDS is only a, a log system. It's not going to tell you, uh, try and prevent the attack. You need to regularly review the logs, which is sometimes time consuming, but use that time to reduce the false positives. All the scans that you're getting from China, for instance. Alert based on certain events. If you know a certain type of attack is a really bad one, have it generate an alert. Elasticsearch, Paper Trail, they will hook into Nagios if that's what you're using. It will probably work with Zabbix. Uh, avoid the boy who cried wolf, which is to say, reduce the amount of noise that's been spewed out by the logs and provide only important inf information events to your team to deal with, things that they can actually tackle. Ensure you're getting signature updates. If you have an IDS system that you don't update for 10 years, you have an IDS system which is a vulnerability. IPS. An IPS will prevent things or it won't. So, an IPS is a prevention system. If it does prevent a known good attack, note it down, write an exception, or pay the company that's providing it to do it for you. Don't just disable it, don't think it's like SE Linux, I'm turning it off, it blocks somebody from completing a purchase. If you're turning it off, you're doing it wrong, you're wasting money. Review the logs, reduce the noise, Provide only contextual information to your team. Ensure you're getting signature updates. So, emerging technologies, and I've got to speed up here. Vault project deploys AES GCM 256-bit encryption. It has API REST-based access. It provides dynamic secrets. It's highly available if you choose the console backend. It has an audit logging backend as well. You can, it has an encrypt and decrypt service in case you were actually doing this in your application. Vault can provide it as well. You can do leasing and renewing. It has many, many integrations already for AWS, MySQL, Postgres, SSH. Hackass security is a great one as well. It's written in Lua, and it uses the Lua DSL syntax that allows you to write firewall rules as a developer. Uh, Fido Alliance is a great big collection of companies that are trying to drive a universal two-factor standard. So you've got the universal second factor, or U2F, the Universal Authentication Framework, or UAF, and there's an extensive membership list. Keybase.io, if you have not used or heard of Keybase.io, please go and have a quick play with it. It socializes PGP encryption. It provides encryption for off-the-record chats. It uses a, what they call a paper key for that. It will also allow secure file sharing. Suricata is an open source IDS, or it's an open source IPS, an intrusion prevention system or an intrusion detection system. It has JSON outputs, which is useful for Elasticsearch. Filtering the information, getting the information back, writing the rules. Claims to have 10 gigabit support, um, does file extraction from the network stream. It's got a bunch of cool features. OS Query is a good one as well. It allows you to roll out a system that reports back on the information that all of your endpoints are running, the endpoints being your end systems. You know, has it got antivirus? Has it got encryption? What browser is it running? What browser plugins are installed? What OS version and patch level is it using? Perfect storm example, okay. So I'm gonna move over to the Linux laptop really quick. I'm probably not got enough time for this, but I'll run the rubber ducky script.
first half of the stack, I'm not actually going to press anything. I'm going to use the bash bunny. Okay? So I'm going to plug this in. And then it's going to go off and pwn a web server. That's nah, not showy. There we go. Might have to do that with the window that it'll pop up in a sec. I hate the demo gods. That's why we have backups. There we go. So, what that should have done is run the Metaterpreter um, MSF console. It will then set up a session there. It will deploy an images.php to the web server. I use curl in the bottom left to then launch that, it then connects back to the command and control server, at which point I can run sysinfo, I can list all the files that are on there, I'm going to cap the database connection file, I'm going to get the MySQL privileges. I'm then going to port forward, which means that I'm going to route the MySQL connection through the web server. Just remember this is all in PHP. So it's going to set up this on my local machine to run on port 4446, it will then connect to port 3306 on the database server, which the command and control system cannot access directly. It's actually going through the web server to hit the database server. <laughs> okay. So I'm connected in, and I've got access to the MySQL system. I'm going to check what the databases are, show what my grants are, I'm going to check what my user is, and I'm going to exit. So full list of databases is also got all privileges. Now, despite the fact that the password was actually really, really, really simple, we can now use this to escalate our permissions and actually get a shell back onto the MySQL system. Um, time. Yeah, just keep going. Cool. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to inject a pre-compiled UDF, and I've written this out into binary, binary data. I'm going to load this into the MySQL table. And because of the all privileges, it's got create routine, etc. I've got file. And if I've got file, and you can't do this by default, this actually abuses something else. It assumes that a DBA or a sysadmin's been in and 777 the directory. So I'm going to write into dump file that binary data. So I've got a .so file in the MySQL system now. I'm going to run these SQL statements. And all of this is up on GitHub. I will provide the slides. They've got the links in it. You can just check this out with Vagrant, and it will deploy it. You can have a play with around with it yourself. But what I've done here is I've created the various routines. And as soon as it runs, I've got a bash shell inside the MySQL protocol. I've just run the ID command on the local system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the bash TCP stack. I'm going to have it connect back to the command and control system as a bash shell. And at that point, I've got a shell on the web server, and I've got a shell on the database server as well. You can then go through privilege escalation to get access to root. They've got both got old kernels on it, so that's very easy to do. Ta-da! Bash shell in the top right, which came from the MySQL server, is connected to the command and control system. So I've got access to a separate database server that's been isolated under PCI standards, and I've got access to the web server, and I can do whatever I want. I can take my time now. OK, so apologies, the live demo decided to not run but I will end it there for any questions.
Nobody ever wants to ask any questions. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, just a few questions, maybe one, two, and another question you can ask today of, on, on SimTech. Uh, on, on SimTech place. Okay. Anyone have a question? No? Thank you. Hello. Hello. Thank you for the presentation. I have two questions for you that are quick, quick questions. Um, the first one, um, you mentioned a lot of uh, attack vectors, uh, weak points that we, uh, someone can abuse. Uh, what do you think is the hardest uh, weak point to fix? I mean, uh, just in general, like uh, maybe it's a human factor or it's a uh, uh, new uh, zero day vulnerabilities and so on. Okay. Um, the weakest point, sorry, the hardest weakest point to always fix is your employees. Every single time, there will always be somebody working for you that is the weakest point in the organization. That doesn't mean that you should eject them out of the company. Whilst that would be funny, you should try and train them up. You should try and get them resistant to these type of attacks. I highly encourage all of you to try and fish your company, to try and socially engineer your company. Not only is it actually quite fun, or maybe I'm just a glutton for punishment, it's actually something that would help build their resistance to those type of attacks. Uh, there are a bunch of free stuff online. Uh, if you want to see me later, I'll give you a list of one of the ones that I use. And you can sign up to the system and you can run fishing attacks out. And you can see what the returns are, see who enters the credentials. Thank you. Uh, the other question is about, uh, do you ever feel safe for the system, your systems you're responsible for as a security professional, or it's just a everyday paranoia about something can happen uh, in a minute? So from a personal standpoint, no, I'm paranoid. From a CISSP standpoint, I control as much as the business can. So what I mean by that is the systems that I am responsible for, I have a bunch of what's called baselines. These are configuration standards that I have developed to say we will deploy SSH in this, in this particular manner. We will deploy Apache in this particular manner. And I have written playbooks to run those and help force configuration consistency. So I've done as much as possible to limit the liability of the company. So. Thank you. And the last one, very quick. Uh, what is your personal attitude uh, on um, about the people who who are trying to exploit uh, to to make attacks, and to those tricks they just create? Uh, they uh, they are creative sometimes, very creative people. And I think uh, personally, I can even admire some of the tricks that uh, people uh, create every day to trick other people. Uh, what do you think about it? I think it's great. I love reading about creative attacks. I love reading about certain things where you just think it would never happen in a million years. I love ones with really long chains where they've gone through about 20 steps to get root on something. Uh, I, I've on many times, and I've blogged about this on my personal blog several times as well, um, there was a PHP shell recently that, um, that I saw and a client got attacked with. But with this PHP shell, they actually write, wrote it um, with a self-decrypting algorithm, a custom one. And if you didn't have the correct key, it wouldn't unpack the string because it was running ORD against all of the strings to try and get the valid ones back and then run a sissy val against it to execute the PHP. So unless you had the valid password, this whole PHP file was completely gibberish. And it took me about a month to decipher what the hell it did. And I had to do a bunch of pattern searching to find the original author and then pull that code down. But those type of attacks make me think, you sneaky little... But they are fantastic, and I love reading about them. Thank you. Question down here.
Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I have a question uh, for the company that works for, in the development, and they just started to implement in the security in, for the application they develop. Uh, what is the best um, way to approach this? Because they just uh, learning that there is uh, HTTP certificates and uh, should be encrypted uh, uh, traffic and what uh, the path um, uh, development team should take to uh, uh, lead the client in the right way of establishing uh, security. Okay, so this is an internal application. Is it a web-facing one? Yes, it's a web-facing one. Okay, so take a, do some OS intelligence, some open source intelligence, see what information you can get back, um, have a look at things like OWASP for their top 10 and see whether or not you can secure the application against that. Then build a threat model um, see whether or not you need to have encryption of the data streams between the various nodes that you have in the application. Uh, you need to build, ideally, a threat model of what you're worried about and then work planning as to how you're going to be able to fix it. Um, but if it's just a web-facing application, OWASP Top 10 is the best place to start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.